Welcome to the lumbar spine module. I'm going to dive in here. I'm going to share my screen with you. You should have all gotten the PowerPoint presentation via email. And those of you who purchased the manual, we're just doing the very, very last edits. You'll have it by the end of the day today. If you haven't purchased a manual and you would like one, you can let us know. And there's a link that we can send you to purchase the manual. It's $30. We're sending the electronic copy that you can then print and um, use as you like. It's more in detail, a little more in depth than the PowerPoint presentation, but basically the same information. Um, just a really nicer, nicer thing to look at um, with the table of contents and images of all the exercises, which I don't have in the PowerPoint. So it could be a helpful tool if you would like it. Here we are at the rehab course. First of all, tell you why I designed the course um, and who I am. I'm a physical therapist. I graduated in 2002 from Samuel Merritt College of Small Health Science Graduate School in Oakland, California. I also finished my Pilates instructor certification about the same time, just a little bit after finishing that. I have the Physical Therapy Pilates Studio Synergy Plus in San Rafael that's been open since 2005. And my background is actually in circus arts and aerial, aerial arts. So that is, I'm not a dancer like a lot of Pilates instructors, just a circus artist. So yes. <laughs> And then um, we've done a bunch of instructor training, four instructor training. This, would, this is actually the fifth rehab course we're starting. If you're doing the whole course with me, there are six modules covering each area of the body. Um, and then there's two inter modules, which I usually do after the spine, the two spine modules of osteoporosis and scoliosis, just to bring, um, I think it's more important to see the whole spine, understand the whole spine before we really attack those two things. And they need a lot more attention, even more attention than what I'm giving them in the intermodule. It serves as a really nice introduction. And then each module will last, well, it said between four and five sessions. It's actually going to be more like eight sessions per session, depending on how many questions we have and how long we want to take on each session. So there'll be a little bit of variation. The spine modules are the longest modules uh, and the hip and knees quite long. The other ones are a little bit shorter, so they will go by a little bit more quickly. The objectives of the course. So why, why take a course like this? I'm hoping, like I said, that you get really applicable applications for your current client load right away. So to do that, we're gonna review basic anatomy of each area we're going to talk about common syndromes and diagnoses and be able to define them and understand what they are to, and really emphasize what contraindications might be important to know for each diagnosis that someone might walk in with. So you can really keep your clients very safe in your practice. And then also just to gain some insight into more research or later, latest research in rehabilitation and use of Pilates. And then understand what compensation patterns, what does your client look like if they have one of these syndromes? So what compensation patterns you might see so that you might start to recognize different things in different people. And then if you can choose, uh, what I'd love for you is to be able to choose the best exercises for each client based on that syndrome or diagnosis. And then also to know when, when it's gone above our heads, right? When they need to get referred out to a medical provider um, either a physical therapist, a chiropractor, a doctor, just depending on what's going on, when is it really important to refer that person out and when is it okay not to? So for sort of, for if you're after the full certification, each after each lecture, I'll provide you with a quiz that you can take. It's about 20, 10 to 20 questions and mostly fill in the blanks. So uh, I'm not a big fan of multiple choice. I know some of you are and some of you are not fans of fill in blanks, but I just like fill in blanks because you can say answer the way that comes naturally for you. So there's a little quiz after each module. And then at the end of everything, we'll do a case study practical exam where you get to present. I'll present you with a case study and you get to demonstrate what you would do with that client. You actually physically demonstrate it and talk us through what you're not doing, what the contraindications are and what the best practice for that patient would be or that client would be. So that is how it will go. And then we'll provide you with the certification for the entire course. And materials, we have the slides, we have the videos, which we'll also make available to you. 
Uh, I've got the manual now with the photos of the exercises if you're interested in that. Um, and then we are doing this all virtually this time. So great. And then for continuing education, it does qualify. And I did talk to the uh, Pilates, National Pilates Certification Agency in the US. And it does qualify. I wanted to, if you are interested in getting CEUs, if you'd let me know, it costs me a lot to do that. If a lot of you want to do it, I will register the course. It just takes a week and I can have that registration. Or if it's just one or two of you, what we might do is have you just petition for it and I'll give you all the information that you need in order to do that. All right. So why start with Pilates or why use Pilates? We're going to cover why Pilates is so important. We're also going to cover what the limitations of the Pilates instructor are and sort of what the scope of that practice is and give you information about what you really can do and then what the importance of that initial intake is, which I'm really a firm believer in doing an initial intake, not just diving into exercise um, and keeping notes. And then also, how can you assess severity of a client? So hopefully you'll have all that information for every diagnosis and every part of the body that we cover. The limitations of the Pilates practitioner with spinal conditions. So the thing about being a Pilates instructor is that we technically can't treat injuries. We can't either evaluate really or de de determine uh, what the injury is. We cannot, definitely can't diagnose. In California, even physical therapists are not allowed to diagnose. It has to come from a medical doctor. Hopefully that's starting to ease up a little bit and change. But so far, um, only medical doctors and I think chiropractors are allowed to diagnose. And um, we, uh, a Pilates practitioner, unless you have other training, I know some of you do have training in massage techniques and body work, that's separate. But just as Pilates, you're actually not licensed to do massage, soft tissue work, or prescribe braces and orthotics. So that's not within the scope of a Pilates practitioner. What you can do for a client who suffers pain, you can really listen. I found in my practice, what makes me a good physical therapist is not that I'm super smart, um, as much as I like to try and be smarter all the time, but it's not that I'm super smart. That's not what makes me a good, uh, physical therapist or Pilates practitioner. It's the fact that I actually take the time to listen. I find that if I really listen to what my clients are saying, then I gather so much information and they end up telling me what they need and what's wrong with them. I can just by listening understand, and understanding what they're saying, I figure so much out that way. So I think it, it really isn't um, rocket science or knowing everything, it's really listening. And many times I will walk away from a session, have an idea of what I think is going on, and then I'll be out on a run, and all of a sudden I'll go, oh my gosh, and all those pieces come together for me, and I can then really understand what that client is going through a little bit more deeply and really understand what they need. So I really encourage you to take time and really listen to what they're saying. Ask good questions, and I'll help you with what those questions might be so that your client gives you the information that you need to help them the most. So also, I want you to learn to notice. If you sit, we have a running joke in my family, my husband and I, that it's impossible to go sit at a coffee shop or sit at a restaurant or even really go on a hike without noticing how everybody's moving, especially when they're moving incorrectly. I, I do notice beautiful movement. When I see an amazing runner coming by, I'm just awed. I love watching beautiful bodies moving through space. Dancing is the same. I love watching, um, but I, I also can't help going, ooh, look at that, how that person's running, or look how that person's walking, and I can't wait to get my hands on that. Maybe I should just give them a business card because they're going to need help because that, look at that knee turn in. And, you know, so hopefully I will, if you're not already doing this, I will change your life so that you can never sit anywhere in a public place and not be um, admiring or hoping to fix somebody walking by you. So that, that's our running thing. We can't just relax and be normal humans anymore. <laughs> so you want to be able to look for those faulty movement patterns. You can. You can strengthen and lengthen, which is so powerful in rehabilitation. You can help stretch. 
you can help coordinate movement patterns. That is so incredibly um, important too. I'm sure you've seen it um, even in, in your older population or in your athletes, they can't coordinate the muscles. They are using the wrong muscles for the wrong thing. You've all seen it. Everybody walking, people walking around like this all day or reaching up and their shoulder goes up before their arm even does. So we can help them coordinate movement patterns. We can develop fitness programs and we can definitely know what contraindications we need to uh, use in order to keep somebody safe. And we can also know when to refer somebody out when they need more help than what we can actually provide. All right, so why do an intake? Uh, and what is that intake? I think an intake form is a really great idea, but don't do an intake form if you don't have time to look at it before the client, before you actually interact with the client. So it really, we have one at the studio. It really only takes a few seconds. I'll show it to you in just a moment or a similar one in just a moment. It only takes them about three or four minutes to fill out. And it really only takes me a minute or two to look over. So even if they come in and they haven't filled it out ahead of time, I can look at it for a moment, just ponder what they filled out. And it guides me in the direction of asking really relevant questions. It just guides our session a little bit more. It also helps go through, if you want to have them write down any other injuries and illnesses, it helps kind of check off some boxes so you know that you're checking for a few things that may be may have an impact on how you want to treat them in, in your studio. So that form you can use to start a discussion. You can use that as a liability release form. You can use it to look for other issues that might change or direct your sessions. And you can also help it will also help you to understand what your customer needs and or wants. Yeah. And here is an example intake. It's pretty small, um, but hopefully as you get a good look at it, you can review it on the PDF. But the idea is to ask about their injury, about, uh, ask if they have any history, and uh, also ask if there's any contraindications uh, or any injuries that you need to know about and to make sure they're in good health. All right, so the questionnaire, it really, remember, is a conversation, conservation, conversation starter only. You do need to ask more questions, and you also want to ask questions about a person's fitness level before you start them on the machines. You guys have seen those people who are super gung-ho, but then they fatigue after about half an hour, or if somebody's recovering from an injury, they're not going to have the, the endurance that they once did before an injury. You also want to find your hook. I call it the hook. Most people, and maybe you guys have experienced this, but most people who come in to a Pilates session, they want to get on the equipment. They want to try out that equipment. They've heard so much about the reformer and how great it is, and they can't wait to get on there. If you, if, even in your best mind, if you know that the reformer might not be the place you want to spend all your time with that person, I would say if you think that that's what they're after, you definitely want to create a hook. You want to put them on that reformer and let them get a little, fall in love with it, get a little addicted to it. You could do something really safe and simple, with footwork you could do with almost anybody. And so you find that little hook or what do they need? Really listening to them at that intake will give you that information. And then once you've got them hooked, then you can go back around and say, okay, you really need to learn how to hold neutral spine because the person can't even hold neutral spine, but at least they got a ride on the reformer and you kept them safe doing it. And you know, they're going to come back because they got what they thought they came, what they thought they wanted when they came in. Right. So that's the hook. And then I highly, highly recommend that you keep notes. So we just had an incident with a client who came in and worked with one of the Pilates instructors who is super diligent and has been giving her all to this client who's a little bit unsatisfied in all aspects of life right now and has pain, which can make people feel also worse in their daily life. And she came to a session, the session went fine. Uh, and two weeks later, she canceled a session, but didn't explain why. And then two weeks later came back and said, you hurt my shoulder in the last session. Right. So luckily for us, there were notes from that session that showed exactly which exercises she had done in that session, how many repetitions. And we always write down if there's been any complaint of pain or anything going wrong in the session. So luckily, we have that note already. We could review it and see what had happened. And we can realize if 
we actually caused some pain or what might have caused that pain. Um, and so we know where to go forward from there. If there's no notes, uh, there, it's really hard to track, especially when you're seeing a lot of people in a day. So I really highly recommend keeping those notes. Also for liability, if you are in the US, and in I think it's true across the US, I'll, but I can only speak to California, people can be really litigious and you really, it's really protection for you liability wise if you have some notes that just show what you did because then you can explain this is what I did, it is in within my scope of practice, I didn't do anything that I shouldn't have done. So you have that as, as written proof. Yeah, so. Okay, and then uh, you could use any sort of note sheet this is one that we used to use. Now we're all online with the with the note taking, but something simple that works for you. It doesn't have to be anything fancy, just that you can keep in a file for the client, or if you're doing it online, you can keep it online um, in a note system as well. Okay, and then assessing severity. So how do you assess somebody's severity? I think it's super important to know how much pain that person is in. And in physical therapy, and I think in most medical fields, we use the pain scale, the zero to 10 pain scale. Zero, no pain. 10 is the most pain you could ever imagine ever having in your life. Uh, so where on that scale do you fall? And then you have an idea, right? If they're one or two, you know it's not very severe. It's not keeping them up at night. If they're up at a five, that's already pretty significant, if you ask me, especially if it's like a consistent five. If they're higher than five, like going up seven, eight, you want to be really careful with that person because any more pain is really may put them over that edge, right? So you want to really ask that question. It's a really easy question. People, some people go, oh, I don't know on the pain scale. And then I always tell them, well, it's up to you. It's how much pain you have yourself, not how much pain the person I have. It's how much pain you have. So we can come back and ask you the question again, and you can give us another ranking, right? Uh, asking about frequency of pain, how often does it come on? Is it all the time? Does it come and go? And asking them, what does it limit? What can you not do? Does it hurt when you're sitting? Does it hurt when you're standing? Is it limiting your daily function or can you get through your day without any trouble? That's a really great question. And then how long does the pain last? If you get pain, does it stay? all day or does it come you have pain in that moment and then you move out of position and the pain goes away that's really great information also because then you know if they have pain for a moment while you're doing an exercise and you take them out of the position that they're going to not have pain anymore and so it's not too bad but if they if they have pain and then the pain once it comes on stays on you're going to really have to be careful about what positions cause pain and avoiding those in your sessions. So, uh, and then what needs to be done for the pain to go away is also really great to know. And then also thinking about, and this, this is something that you can roll around in the back of your head. Could there be a psychological component to pain? And I could talk about this all day. I'm not going to, because that's not what we're here for today. But just to keep this rolling around in your head, sometimes uh, there is pain, physical pain, that is coming from other things going on in life, stress, um, depression, anxiety, all of those things can, can really contribute to physical pain. So if, there's, if you start getting to know somebody and you realize that there's a lot going on in the background that is maybe, or maybe it's not causing the pain, but it's not allowing them to heal from their pain, that might be another referral uh, opportunity where you could say, hey, do you talk to somebody about all that's going on in your life, you have so much going on. And maybe it's not letting you heal as much as we want you to heal. So that could be something as well to just sort of roll around in the back of your head as a potential referral. Okay, so that was the introduction. Here, I'm gonna go ahead. Do you guys have any questions that you wanna ask about any of that before I head on? All right, well then, I'm going to move forward here, and so um, we will dive right in. So what are we doing with the lumbar spine course, and what are our objectives? I think you probably have a good sense already, but we want to know, understand why Pilates is such a successful form of exercise in stabilizing the lumbar spine and SI joint. And 
I said, we want to understand why. Because it is, we know that it is. And that's what's so exciting. Pilates has come up in the research and I'll share some of that with you down the road here. But it's come up in the research a lot in really helping with lumbar and SI joint uh, issues, spinal issues. So it's already being researched. It's fantastic that it's already being researched. Um, and so we can really use it um, in, in our practice and know that we're doing the right thing. So we can also we're going to also learn and understand common spinal conditions uh, pertaining primarily to the lumbar spine. We're going to learn the contraindications for each spinal condition. We'll develop modifications for clients with these common conditions. We can maximize the benefits of Pilates for each individual if we understand what's going on with their body, and we can maximize the risk of future injury um, with exercise and in their daily life. Right. We can also know how to create a very safe exercise program for each client with a lumbar spine or SI joint dysfunction. So what are we going to cover? We're going to cover discogenic pain and that I've included kind of under it's a little umbrella to address uh, disc protrusion, disc herniation, degenerative disc disease and sciatica all kind of under one umbrella of discogenic pain. We're gonna talk about spinal stenosis. We're gonna talk about ankylosing spondylitis. And I have to say that I always go back and forth whether or not to include this, and I'll explain more why when we get to this part of the module. But it's not as common. I have seen it in clinic a couple times, but I left it there since it was there, and I'll explain more when we get there. We're gonna talk about spondylolisthesis, which is pretty common in young people too. Uh, acute facet pain and facet osteoarthritis. We're going to talk about sprains and strains of the low back, and we'll talk about sacroiliac dysfunction as well. And then for each one, we'll, uh, for now, as a start of the session, we'll talk about um, how to intake specifically for the lumbar spine, what some key concepts are to review those. We'll do an anatomy review, and we'll look at vertebral movements, and then we'll get into all of the syndromes. All right, so the, the intake screening for lumbar spine. So what you want to do here specifically, we wanna ask, um, even if they filled out a form, a lot of people fill out a form and they put down, no, I don't have any current pain. So it's really important to ask, have you ever had low back pain? And most people have had some incidents of low back pain. Which, yeah, if they say, yeah, I had back pain when I was 15, I did this, I fell on my back, I fell off somebody's piggyback and landed on my back and it really hurt for a long time and I've never had any problems since. Then you can say, okay, that's healed and I probably don't have to worry about that. But if they say, uh, oh yeah, you know, then I get this often, it surprises me how often this happens. Oh yeah, you know, no, I don't really have back pain, but you know, once a month, I, um, once a month I have to stay in bed for two days because I just move the wrong way and my back gives out and, and then I'm fine again. And then, and then it happens, you know, probably once a month. So that's a red flag, obviously. I, you guys would pick that up too. And it may not be as frequent as once a month, but I hear it all the time, twice a year or once in a while I have, my back goes out, right? That's a warning sign. And we'll talk about what that could mean later on as we go through. Um, I also asked, does it hurt when you lift things? Can you lift things? Do you feel like you have any movement restrictions? Are you careful when you do things or do you do whatever you want whenever you want, right? So those are all great questions you can have. Um, does your back ever flare up? Do you have pain with bending forward or bending backward? Have you, and, and one question I put in here is, have you ever had a bone density scan? And so this, uh, we'll talk about it a little bit when we get to the osteoporosis module really more, but I think women, women are tested more than men for osteoporosis. The bone density scan can show uh, obviously osteoporosis. It can also show any fractures that may or may not have happened uh, in the body. The other people to watch for for bone density scan are young uh, athletes who may not who may be undernourished. Not some of them because of anorexia or problems, eating disorder problems, some of them just because they're training so hard, right? And they can't get enough nutrition. We have nutrition, we should ask Erica about this. 
uh, <laughs> right? We, uh, but some of them are just not able to take in enough nutrition for the amount of physical work that they're doing. So sometimes that can cause bone loss. So those are other people. And then also men do have osteoporosis. It just happens a little bit later. So if you work with a population of older men, you want to ask them also about a bone density exam. I would say men over 65, I would ask them as well. If you have any uh, inclination, perhaps that they may or may not, or have a history or their posture indicates that maybe they're getting a little kyphotic, those are great people to ask also if they've had a bone density exam, a scan. And then, um, and any other indication that you might have osteoporosis or osteopenia. So uh, familial history, right? The tends to run in families. Uh, and so that is a great indicator of osteoporosis or osteopenia. Okay, so why does Pilates work for the spine? Pilates develops strength in the deep abdominals, right? So, and I'll show you all the musculature again, just to review, but the deep abdominals, why do they even work to help the spine? Uh, and when we talk about deep abdominals, right, we're referring mostly to transverse abdominis and the obliques, but they're close enough to the spine. If they're working right, they can give a lot of support so the back doesn't have to take all the weight. Most of the time people are really imbalanced, right? Abs versus back. The back is stronger, the abs are weaker. Um, and that can happen, uh, happens kind of naturally as people age and get a little bit heavier in their middle section. Also women who have had babies and don't rehab that, that's been all those muscles stretched out. It's really hard to get them back strong. Also um, men tend to gain weight in their abdomen, right? And they get the belly coming out in the front. So those muscles are, are distended and not working as well to support the spine. Plus that, you know, that changes posture too, puts them in a little bit more low doses. So um, getting strong abs can help address those issues. It can help correct posture. It can also, working on the spine, we can also minimize thoracic kyphosis, right? That forward leaning body posture. We can lengthen and strengthen the body front and back without adding bulk. So that's really fabulous for, for us in the healing process. We can isolate muscles, right? A lot of times, a lot of exercises people do don't really isolate. And you guys have seen it, right? They're tucking their butts and lifting their, using their hip flexors to lift their legs to tabletop instead of using their abs to do the work. And you've seen it in people who run, you know, with this low down posture, hips behind them, they never lift up onto the balls of the feet, right? They're just kind of sitting while they walk and run. So you've seen this, and, and we'll go through them even in more detail as we go on. So um, these, the, those things about Pilates, just these things about Pilates can really help us a lot. And the guiding principle when we're talking about strengthening the lumbar spine is creating stability in the body, right? We create stability from the center, and that allows freedom of motion of all our appendages, um, hips, knees, shoulders, neck is part of the spine, I know, but also head, right? So it, if we're stable in the center, we can move everything else with ease and without causing problems for ourselves. Okay, oh, we already did this one, sorry. Okay, so key phrases, concepts, we'll talk about spinal curves, neutral spine, neutral pelvis, flat back, we'll talk about the powerhouse, the core muscles, and what is abdominal scoop. So here um, with the key phrases, we have um, spinal curves to review, right? So our spinal curves, if you guys remember, we have lumbar lordosis, right? So a little arching in the lumbar spine, hopefully a little lumbar spine curve. We have thoracic kyphosis, so coming forward in the thoracic spine. We have cervical lordosis. And then the spinal curve mimics the thoracic, thoracic curve, so kind of a kyphotic into the tailbone. Right, so that's ideally how the curves should sit in the body. Now, with Pilates, it's interesting to mention, right? Joe Pilates back in the 40s, right? He was teaching flat back, he was teaching people to tuck their butt and to straighten the curves of the spine because at that time he believed that straightening the spine was going to make it the strongest that it could be. There are some people that still practice all in flat back. I don't, I practice in neutral spine. I use flat back when I feel like it's helpful, 
But I really want people to be functional in neutral spine. We now know that those curves in the spine, they provide cushion, um, they provide shock absorption and cushion for the body and the impact uh, on the discs. So without the curve, we're actually gonna be more likely to injure than if we can maintain our normal spinal curves. And posturally, the little picture you have there is a plumb line, right, that goes down through the ear, the shoulder, the hip and the foot, right? So that is going all the way down through. That's ideal posture that we want, not head forward or back forward or butt tucked, right? We wanna see if that plumb line could run ear, shoulder, hip, middle of the ankle, right? That would be the ideal posture with the ideal spinal curves. Okay, so neutral spine, when we talk about neutral spine, we're discussing the spine's position, right? So it refers to the position of the spine when it's in a normal curve. What's the normal curve? That's the big question, right? So if, if I had you all stand up right now and you could all see each other, right? You, if we all stood up in profile, every single one of us would have a different curve. If we take a bendy ruler, and you could do this if you want, take a bendy ruler and place it along your spine all the way up to your neck, and we laid them down in a row, you'd see a huge variation of these spinal curves. So which, which one of us has the right spinal curve? Well, probably we all have a very close version of a right spinal curve. The ones of you who have a forward head, so fess up if you've got forward head, spend too much time on your computer, right? That's the wrong curve. <laughs> Everybody else has some version of a right curve. Yeah, so some of us can be a little, we can get, uh, so I'm saying all that to just say that there is no set normal. I can't give you a degree measurement and say that that's the right amount of curving in your spine. They should be pretty even, and you don't wanna see any part of the spine cutting in, if you know what I mean. So sometimes you'll look at people's bodies and there'll be one vertebra that looks like it just goes in and everything else is out from that. So they have like a kind of a one indent. You see it a lot in the lumbar spine um, and you see it a lot with people who have what I like to call luxurious bottoms. Yes, so you know what I mean when I say that, right? They have more of more glute, more muscle, more meat back there. And so it makes it, the balance shifts a lot of times, the bottom out, and there's a little straight indent into the spine in one level. If that, that could be problematic. So that's something to look at as maybe being a potential place of working on, depending on where the rest of their posture is and what their other curves look like. But we want to see a pretty even cervical and lumbar spi uh, spinal curves that match and then a thoracic curve that goes a little bit forward but not rolling and dropping everything forward yeah so take a look at some of the cl your clients and see what you start to see about the variations in the curve and if you have a bendy ruler they're easy to find you could get one and just measure people for your own information and see it could be a fun little project for yourself to just compare um, okay, so then neutral spine is going to change a little bit when we change our posture. So if we stand, if I stand, I have a neutral spine stance. If I lay down in hook lying with my knees bent, right, I have a, my, pretty much the same curve that I have in standing. If I bring my legs up to tabletop or hold my legs up, my spinal curve naturally drops a little bit. And that's still normal spinal curve, right, unless I'm purposely flattening my back into the table that would be a little bit different. That would be more of a flat back. So we're gonna refer to the neutral spine in all those positions, uh, and we'll go through it all with all the exercises too. Also, just keep in mind, neutral spine should be comfortable. People should not feel like they're straining if they're in neutral spine. So I had somebody come to me once who said to me, yeah, I got hurt at the last Pilates studio. The instructor told me that I needed to arch my back more. And when I did, I told her that it was uncomfortable, but she continued to say, but I have to be in neutral spines. So remember, keep in mind, neutral spine is different for everybody. What I usually have people do is lay down, lift their bottom, set it down and relax for a moment. And that's their neutral spine. And that's the neutral that I want to try and support. Usually that's it, unless there's some huge dysfunction there. Right. Okay. So here's a little image of neutral spine versus flat back. So, um, we're, oh, I'm sorry, this is the neutral pelvis. So that was neutral spine, this is neutral pelvis. We're looking at, it, neutral pelvis is not always 
the same as neutral spine. Sometimes it is and sometimes it isn't. And we could, you could ask Andrea about this. She and I have compared our neutral spine, neutral pelvis a bunch of times. When I lie down, the neutral pelvis refers to the ASIS, the two bones on the top, and my pubic bone being in the same plane, right? So being in that frontal plane at the same level. That's neutral pelvis. Uh, some people like myself in neutral spine and have neutral pelvis. Andrea, I'm using you, Andrea, sorry, has a luxurious bottom. And so when she lies down in neutral pelvis, she's, if she wants neutral pelvis, she's arching her back a little bit. If she wants neutral spine, you're tilting your pelvis backwards, right, Andrea, a little bit? <laughs> yep. Yep, that's it. Yeah, so it's going to depend, and that's what you're seeing in the picture here. You're seeing a neutral pelvis in that top frame, and you're seeing a flat back, flattening back in the bottom frame right, to get that neutral pelvis. So it's going to depend on what's happening in the, in the bottom side too, um, depending on if you can have neutral spine and neutral pelvis together. So just keep that in mind and know what you need for a particular exercise or movement or posture that you want. Is it neutral spine that you want where you want that neutral lumbar spine or is it a neutral pelvis that you want where you have the ASIS and the pubic bone all in one plane? We can also talk about um, the pelvis and alignments in the pelvis based on tilt, lateral tilt. So in the first images here, you have a neutral position and then you have a butt out position, right? So uh, increased lumbar lordosis. And then you have a flat back position next to it, right? With the spine long and the tail curling. So that would be more straightening out, flattening or tucking pelvis. Right, so anterior pelvis is this middle one. Posterior pelvis is this last image. And then neutral pelvis is the one right here on the left. We can also talk about lateral tilting. We have the two sides. We can talk about one side raising up on the other. That's a lateral tilt. Um, and that can happen for a number of reasons. We'll talk about some of those reasons too. But so we could have one side elevated versus the other. And that's how we create a lateral tilt. We could also have one side of the pelvis anterior on the other, or one side of the pelvis posterior on the other. So we don't always go anterior with both sides, and we don't always go posterior with both sides, just because we like to keep things complicated, right? <laughs> so we can walk up and down stairs, we can walk up and down hills, right? That's what we need all that motion for. And we can walk on uneven surfaces. The hope is that it all comes back to neutral when we stop and rest. So that's when we're good and healthy. Okay, so here's um, a little bit of a kind of a pros to flat back. Pro main pros to flat back is that it can really support the spine. So if somebody needs support, uh, flat back would be a good position to put them in. If they are unstable, you could also support them by putting a little wedge under if you're worried about them hurting or straining their back, or if they're not strong enough to lift their legs up. I'm sure you've all used tools like that to put them into a more flat back position intentionally. The other time that flat back can be really useful is when you need to create space in the spine. Somebody who has a compression problem in the back or a nerve compression problem, and you need to stretch that out, that flat back could be really helpful. Pros to neutral spine, neutral spine is more functional, right? That's how you're gonna move around in the world. So we want to strengthen somebody in a way that they can actually take their Pilates practice and take it outside into their life, right? So strengthening them in neutral spine will help them do this. So that's what we want to, that's one of the main reasons we want to strengthen in neutral spine. It also helps uh, strengthen both the front and the back simultaneously, which is great. And we can use it in all different positions. So we can use that in prone, we can use it in supine, we can use it on side lying, we can use it in all kinds of positions, right? It also strengthens the body um, like I said, in all, all sides, creating this nice belt all around. Um, and then again, refers to all the function that they can do in life and sports. And then here was just a, a neutral spine versus flat back in the hook line position, right? So it stays pretty much the same. If I'm neutral, flat back is an intentional flattening of the spine. All right, so Pilates powerhouse 
is sort of that classic term, right? We've all heard Pilates powerhouse. And I just wanted to differentiate for a moment. You guys all know what it means, but I wanted to make the differentiation between Pilates original terminology of the powerhouse, which is the inner thighs, the glutes, and the deep abdominals, right? That's Joe Pilates, what he thought of as the powerhouse. Um, and then differentiate that from uh, the powerhouse that we think about now or that I like to think about, which includes a lot more, right? It's the deep abdominals, it is the inner thighs, um, it is the glutes, but it's also multifidus. It's also the pelvic floor, right? And the diaphragm can help as well if we use it properly. So we have this full house. <laughs> now we have the bottom, the top, we have the front and we have the back all surrounding. So um, the, the main reason why inner thighs are really fantastic to use because they help us with the pelvic floor activation. So activating inner thighs really can help the pelvic floor activate more. Um, and then multifidus is something that we added in later. The Pilates Method Alliance added it into their terminology of powerhouse because we know that that's a deep stabilizer in the spine too. So just like transverse abdominus in the front, Multifidus in the back are those deep stabilizers that really help us control and stabilize the spine. Okay, and then, um, so I think what I'll do is I'm gonna pause here and just see if the last couple minutes here, if anybody has any questions, and then we'll pick up from here next time, diving right into the material. So um, does anybody have any questions? Can you review the last um, slide you did the, the anatomy? The last slide? Um, yeah, the, the multifidus, just, just oh, go over. Oh, multifidus? Yes. yes. Let me find that. We're going to also look at it again. Believe it or not, I have two clients, um, two male clients with AS. You said it, how rare it is, and I'm looking for oh, it. Really? Yeah. yeah. Okay, great. Well, I'm glad. And um, so the picture of the multifidus was, where did we have that? Oh, I didn't show you the picture of multifidus just yet. These are the abdominals. This was coming, if that's what you were after. No, I'm sorry. It was, oh, I guess I was ahead. Sorry. We're getting there. We're getting there. Yes, no, I'm glad you're excited to get there. I think you had mentioned it. What I think I, I was listening it. and I was envisioning. I think it was two slides yeah. up. Sorry. That's okay. No problem. Yeah, we're going to, and we'll look at it here, and then I have it on the anatomy part two. We'll really get a little bit more in depth with it to really show you that as well. But yeah, yes, we will definitely get to that. I'm glad that you're looking forward to it. Okay, hi, it's Erin. Um, yeah, I really like that you added uh, multifidi into that because the way Jean-Claude explained it is, you know, they're stabilizers, they're anti-rotators at a certain point. They're like little, mm -hmm. you know, almost like they, they, they'll, you know, when you go into too much rotation, they'll stop the spine. But what's really interesting mm -hmm. is without real breath, most people come in and they're breathing auxiliary, either in their shoulders or in their belly. They're not finding that bucket. They're not finding their real lungs. So the, motif, the multifidus really won't fire unless you really have full breath. And that's how they get weak. That's how I have learned it. So anything crossing the body, you know, on quadruped and doing one arm, um, one leg, that's um, challenging that. But what, what is your thought on that about breath and multifidi? Um, I definitely think there's a lot of truth in that. Um, I think it's I think it's really hard to access the whole thing if you're not breathing uh, properly, especially if you're staying up here because we're never getting rib expansion either. So we can have a whole conversation about breath <laughs> uh, also on that. But yeah, it, it's everything right in order to get that breath and the diaphragm working properly uh, and stabilizing properly and stretching properly those deep muscles we need. We need it all to be happening. So we definitely need that expansion, rib expansion, rib contraction, diaphragm lifting, diaphragm dropping, and that's all gonna be affected by uh, the muscles in the core, right? Okay, great. I just wanted to know your thoughts on that, so. Yes, more coming. 
Great. Any other questions? Good. I, I have to say today's the most boring day. I promise it gets even more interesting. Um, so hang in there. If you guys have questions between now and next session, please feel free to email me. I'm always happy to take your questions. If I don't know an answer, I will find one. Um, if not on the spot, really soon after and respond to you in some way, shape or form. And so that we can all learn from this together. And so, yeah, if you have trouble with anything technologically, please reach out to Tiziana or myself. We'll, we'll help you with that as well. And I look forward to seeing you guys all again next week.